if you'll remain standing while we read the scripture today. The scripture today is about Mary. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, we're continuing in our series on the characters of Christmas, and I get to be Mary. (laughs) Actually, I'm not Mary, and I don't get to be Mary, but I get to preach about her and about what a faithful, amazing woman, young woman, she really is. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you. Thank you for being with us today, for this season. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, many pictures come to us, I think, in our minds when we think of Mary. She is so central to this story, yet so enigmatic. She draws us in, yet we really don't know that much about her. When I was in ninth grade, now this is just a few years ago, (laughs) I realized, I think for the first time, being a Protestant, being a Presbyterian, I think for the first time I really began to think about Mary. Our music director at our school decided for the Christmas program that year, and this was in the era where you had Christmas programs at school with sacred music, and she decided that along with the choir presentation, off to the side would be a tableau of Mary and Joseph and the babe behind a gauzy kind of curtain where you could just see them as shadows. They wouldn't say a word. They would just be a presence a presence to remind the people why they were there. Oh, I wanted to be Mary. (laughs) After all, I had long black hair. That seemed to fill the bill, and so I thought this was going to be a slam dunk. And so after class, I went to the teacher, and I told her that I would love to be Mary. And she said that she was thinking about who would be Mary, and she would let me know. And the next day when I went to class, she had chosen a lovely young woman who had long blonde hair and blue eyes. These things matter in ninth grade. (laughs) But I think now, as I look back on it, perhaps the teacher got her idea of what Mary would look like from a Renaissance painting. Mary, adorned, adorned in brocade, halo around her head, looking adoringly at the baby Jesus. In the Orthodox Church, in the Orthodox Greek Church, she's called Theotokos, the mother of God, and she should look this way. She should be venerated, adored, and adorned in the finest raiment, and talked about in the most awe-inspiring words. Yet, that really isn't who Mary is at all when we first meet her in Luke. She is a teenager, perhaps 13, 14 years old. She's from a small village of maybe 500 people that only made it onto the map, Nazareth, because it was on the way to a bigger trade city. And she is engaged to a man named Joseph. Joseph and Mary had already exchanged marital consent 
but she had not yet been taken into his home. There could be another character in our painting. You see them, you see him in many of the Renaissance paintings, and that is the angel Gabriel. Gabriel, the one who would speak for God. He is often depicted hovering over Mary or being around her with big feathery wings or bowing before her in reverence. The angel of the Lord revering this young woman. Well, Gabriel comes to Mary, and I always picture to her, he comes one night to talk with her, and he says, Mary, don't be afraid. Favored one, don't be afraid. You're going to conceive a son and name him Jesus. Now, if you read the scripture carefully, we see that, that he isn't asking her if she'd like to participate in this particular event. He's telling her what is going to happen. God's great and glorious plan is about to commence. Mary, the intended wife of a poor carpenter, unnoticed and insignificant, this woman, this girl, significant to God, will be appointed to be the mother of the Savior of the world. Not because of any remarkable trait she had, not because she was constantly praying day and night that this would happen to her, none of those kinds of things, no particular virtue that we know of, but only because of God and God's gracious will to bring Mary this gift and to bring this gift to the world. You know, God loves the lost. He loves the forgotten, the insignificant, the outcast, the weak, the broken, the hurt. He loves us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in one of his Advent sermons, says, where men say lost, God says found. Where men say condemned, God says redeemed. Where men say no, God says yes. Where men are indifferent or superior, God is the love that is incomparable, the love that will change the world, the love that brings Jesus to the world. And now this is where it gets interesting as if it weren't already amazing. We often think Mary wrestled with this decision, this amazing offer. I used to picture her, especially when I was thinking about Mary as a younger girl, her pacing, the, maybe in her bedroom, thinking about what's been happening, praying, wondering what she should do. But we mistakenly put her, or at least I did, mistakenly put her in our world of making decisions, how we would do that, thinking no unsuspecting girl would say yes to this proposal without weighing the consequences or talking to her family about it. Can you imagine that conversation? <laughs> I mean, I thought about this when I was younger. I thought, what would she say to mom and dad? Or praying about it. Could you put it on the prayer chain at church? I don't know what to do. Or wondering, and this I think would be even more true, wondering if she was dreaming or hallucinating. No. No, this is much different than an ordinary decision or an extraordinary opportunity. Mary is in her <clears throat> thoughtful, faithful, and joyful. Well, Gabriel first greeted her with reverence, an angel showing a young unknown girl deep reverence. You are highly favored, he says. And the word in Greek for highly favored is a word that is only used one other time in the New Testament. It means a divine grace, a special grace that has been given to Mary. You have been favored, he says, with holy grace. You are receiving God's predetermined blessing. God is indeed with you. And there isn't any reason to fear. Oh, that would be easy for Gabriel to say. But Mary is human. 
She is a human young girl. She is faithful, fair, fearful and troubled, the scriptures tell us. And this is what makes the story ring true. Am I really hearing and seeing this? Now Mary, as all young Jewish children would have been, was trained to know that God could never be human. The Greek gods had human traits, but not our God. So she wondered. She used her mind, and she asked questions, just as we do when we wrestle with faith. Faith is not easy. Faith is a gift from God. Faith is not something that we reach down deep in us and conjure up and and pull up and, and try and get better at. Faith is something God blesses us with. And Mary was being blessed. Mary believed because she knew the truth. And she was willing to relinquish the control of her life to be the mother of Jesus. So Mary's faith begins to grasp hold of this news, and as Gabriel unfolds the story of what is about to happen, you can imagine her mind trying to take all of this in, her heart pounding, the little hairs on the back of her neck standing up. This was a momentous occasion because God was with her. God wasn't out there somewhere. God was there. And yet she didn't fully understand. The scriptures tell us she pondered. She was perplexed. Mary ponders three times in Luke. She ponders what the angel is saying to her. She wonders about it. When the shepherds come to Mary and tell her of the great news they have received about her son, she ponders what she has been told. And when Jesus, as a young boy, is at the temple teaching the priests, when she finds him and he tells her what he has been doing, she ponders these things and holds them in her heart. That's where we hold the faith that God gives us in our hearts. And now, Gabriel is about to unfold the rest of the message. You will be with child and you will be give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. Your son, yes, this baby to whom you will give earthly life, will be great. He will be God's son. What? He will be God's son? And so she asked the question, Probably the most important question that she had on her mind at that point. How? How can this be since I am a virgin? This is legitimate. Mary knew where babies came from. But this isn't Mary's real question. She isn't as worried about the physicality of what is about to happen. She asks for more information. She wants to make sense out of something that makes no sense at that moment. And there are some very real considerations for her to think about. Pastor Steve preached last week on Joseph, the silent partner that never says anything, but is asked to accept what must have been awfully difficult to accept. And she must have thought, what about Joseph? What will he think of me? Will he divorce me? Will he send me away? And what about the community? How am I going to explain this to them? And what about me? Every woman in history who has been pregnant wonders how they will do this great thing that is happening to their bodies. What about my body? How will it all go? But Mary listened, and she listened intently to the angel. Could it be that God needed her, needed her to consent to surrender this young girl living an average village life off the beaten path? No one really knew who she was. Mary was the only woman in history that had this decision to make. 
to humbly consent, to carry, to give birth, to swaddle, to diaper, to nurse, to nurture, to raise the Son of God. And yes, a very human baby. Because Jesus is at once fully divine and fully human. There are several lessons in this story for us to think about. How do we make our choices? Or do the circumstances of life just choose us? Life can be interrupted, and we all know that, at any time, by any circumstance. Perhaps an aging parent needs help. Or a job offer comes and you are going to move all the way across the country. Or maybe something happens to your own health. Decisions have to be made. And in spite of evidence to the contrary, we have to make those decisions without enough information. So like Mary, the humbling part of decision-making is that decision-making is not easy. And it's never easy if we don't make it with the Lord who has given us life. We are not like some who have said, the authors of our own destiny, if we are people of faith. We, like Mary, are offered faith without guarantees, without a roadmap, without a destination. We are offered faith, the ability to believe that God has it all in his hands and his care, and we can walk with him because he surely has it planned. Well, back to my story, which definitely is not nearly as important as Mary's. The music director called me into her office on the day of the Christmas program. Lynn, I know this is short notice, but can you be Mary tonight? Oh, can I be? But I stoically stood there. The other girl is sick. She's had to drop out. My heart leapt. I was so excited, but I wanted to remain cool. <laughs> I don't know to this day why it was so important to me that I be Mary, because there was nothing going on. I was sitting off to the side, behind a gauzy curtain. Nobody would necessarily even know who it was. And yet, I felt that presence, that need to be in that place, to sit there quietly and just soak it all in. And perhaps that was the presence of God. So I looked at the music director. I said yes. And then I covered my deep gratitude with a face-saving little thank you. <laughs> By the way, the program that night was absolutely wonderful. And I got congratulated on being a wonderful Mary, even though I did absolutely nothing. <laughs> well, the Mary of Scripture has a much greater role to play. And her acceptance of what Gabriel has told her is simple and yet very profound. I am the Lord's servant. Let it be to me as you have said. Many of us have embraced faith and Jesus in this way. We don't know what's going to happen next, but we know we can do nothing but say yes to him who has done all for us. We don't have all the answers when we say yes to Jesus, not even enough to trust ourselves. But we know deep down inside we want what God is offering. And like Mary, the promise is that the Holy Spirit will guide us and will direct our path. He will encourage us and teach us and walk with us through this life of faith. And with this confirmation, 
Mary's faith overflows with praise to the Lord. Every Christian is like Mary. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Think about that for a moment. Christ in us, the hope of glory. We have that gift. Every Christian, especially at Christmas, can be shocked like Mary that God would give us the gift of his son. That's what we're waiting for each year. So who of us wants to celebrate Christmas in this way? Who is content to lay at the manger all that we hold dear? Who will bow before the Lord to be lowly and to let God alone be high? Who of us will say with Mary, the Lord has been mindful of my humble state. My soul praises the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. On the screen are going to be the words of the Magnificat the song that Mary sang in praise to the Lord. I'm going to read these words to you. They are a beautiful, wonderful song and prayer. And notice as I read them, only the first few verses are about Mary. The rest is all about God and what God has done in the gracious divine grace that he has given to us. You may want to even close your eyes while I read these amazing, beautiful words. I'm going to read them from the Bible because they are not the right ones on the screen. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me in his holy name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. This, too, is the word of the Lord. And, Lord, we do thank you for your words to us and for the life of your servant Mary, who teaches us what it means to be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.